Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, my name is Duygu Clark. I'm the founder and the managing partner of Do Venture Partners, a San Francisco-based venture capital firm. I'm investing in early stage tech startups with a focus on Web3 and B2B SaaS. And I'm also an executive MBA student here at MIT. And I'm here with one and only Keith Grossman, the president of Time Magazine. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to talk about Time Pieces, Time's Web3 community and NFTs, of course. And we will have your questions in the last 10 minutes or so. So please prepare your questions for Keith. Keith, thank you so much. It's great to have you here at MIT. Well, thank you. And, and thank you to all of you. Uh, I hope I don't disappoint. And uh, I'm a big privacy advocate, just to put it out there in the beginning. And we will talk about that in a second when we get to it. So <laughs> okay. can you hear Keith, by the way? A little bit? OK. I think maybe we can take this off Keith. I think it's split. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? <laughs> Awesome. Perfect. So, Great. I said sorry. I don't mean to disappoint, and I believe in privacy. <laughs> awesome. So, Keith, I want to start with your personal journey into crypto that sure. goes back to uh, 2013. So, could you tell us a little bit about how it all started for you? Sure. So, I am. Um, so, I, I'm just a dorky guy who likes tech and business and art and crypto. And you know, I started my career at Wired and Ars Technica. And uh, I'll never forget, there was this moment in Wired in 2013-ish around where some of the editors came over to us and they said, we need $6,400. And I said, why? And they said, um, we, have to, we, we have to buy a computer because there's this new digital currency called Bitcoin. We want to mine some of it in, uh, in our offices and write an article about it. And so uh, they, we wrote the check because we were the business side. And they, can you imagine this, like $6,400 to mine Bitcoin back in 2013? It's wild. And I started to become enamored with it back then. Um, you know, Wired actually wrote an article about how they lost the key to uh, the seed phrase to the wallet, which is not true. And I'll say that on the record. Uh, we got into an argument. I wanted it as part of the revenue stream, and they did not want it to conflict with the editorial uh, business side integrity, and so they ripped up the key so nobody could access the Bitcoin. Um, but, uh, and now it's no big deal. It's only a few million dollars worth of Bitcoin that's locked forever. But, um, but from that point forward, I actually just became enamored with the space um, from what it stands for, right, from a thinking perspective, um, uh, what it stands for from an economic perspective, and what it stands for from an individual perspective, which is why I started. And I said, you know, I do think that privacy is a really important issue that, um, that should be discussed and should not be just sort of dismissed as so quickly. Um, from that point forward, I just, I've always been into crypto. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I wish I could be like, I had this moment or I didn't. But like my biggest sort of moment was, Right before the US election, I was watching just every government everywhere spending endless amounts of money on uh, you know, COVID relief and saying at the same time that inflation wasn't going to happen. And you don't have to be an MIT grad student to know endless money is not going to end well if uh, you don't see it going somewhere. And, and I remember I, I moved all my cash into Bitcoin and Ethereum in about September. Uh, of the election year. And every one of my friends asked me the same question, which was, um, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> and, and, I said, and I said, no, no, no. And, and I explained I had my theories on it, and I had my rationale on it, and, and I had my conviction on it. And um, from that point forward, I started to really think about um, what is crypto's role in, in how I can start to think about my larger responsibility for the Time brand. And um, it wasn't until, honestly, the Nyon Cat sale took place in February of 2021, if you remember that, that it dawned on me how we could enter into the space. And um, I got an email from our owner, 
Mark Benioff, who's the CEO of Salesforce. I don't know if you know this, Time is a privately owned asset of, of Mark and Lynn Benioff. And it said, did you see the sale? And I, it just clicked and I said, oh my God, we could do this. And everyone said, what do you mean we can do this? And I said, do you understand why a cat with the body of a Pop-Tart farting a rainbow just went for $300,000? And, and everyone was like, no. And I was like, we got this. I, I know exactly what we have to do. And, and, um, and it just, it all, it all sunk in to me as to sort of the trends that were merging together to sort of give birth to this moment that I think is going to be about a 20 year shift in consumer rentership to online ownership and, and the respect of privacy to the individual, et cetera. So it all, it all started back in 2013 and then fast forward to March 2021 when Time launched its first NFT project, which I believe paved the way for Time Pieces. So Time has sold more than 20,000 NFTs and generated a profit more than $10 million. So could you walk us through this journey? That tell us the vision behind Time Pieces and the, um, the philosophy behind the Time's Web3 community. Sure, so, so, so. Are the numbers true, first of all? The numbers are true. Okay. Um, and as I had mentioned to you, like, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on the numbers getting public, um, but the Press Gazette wrote a piece, they did the math, and they, they realized that we were onto something. Um, so I didn't know how to bring timepieces to market, to be honest. I knew that something was happening. Um, and I think that that was important, right? I just knew that there was a trend line occurring. And I wanted us to be on that trend line. And the things that I saw that were taking place were, uh, if you look and think back to 2020, right? Wherever you were, right? Like, think back. And that year, 2020, just was awful, right? And like, you're at home, you're lonely, you're online nonstop. And the first few realizations I was just having was, wow, like my digital identity is just as valuable as my physical identity, right? And I joke about this all the time. I'm like, on Twitter, I might have 50,000 followers. In real life, I have like two friends. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, but, but the reality is, is that my, my digital identity is just as valuable as my physical identity. And, and people are spending a significant amount of time online, and you cannot disrespect that fact. The second thing that I started to realize was um, uh, online ownership is just as valuable in a world where someone's digital reality is just as valuable as their physical reality as physical ownership, right? Because an asset's an asset's an asset, right? And so somebody, if they value their digital identity, they value what they own in their digital identity. And the NFT space, which I saw initially just as a token interacting and verifying ownership on a blockchain, um, allowed for people to buy collectibles. And then what I was seeing with those collectibles was those collectibles were creating communities. And those communities were coming together based not on shared demographics or shared geographics, but based on shared psychographics. And that's really interesting. I mean, picture that. Like, it's not who you are. It's not what race you are. It's not what gender you are. It's sort of how you think about things. And when I started to see those things coming together, it, it's, I was just like, there's something here, right? And I couldn't quite put my finger on the community aspect of it at first. I wish I could say, like, I had this epiphany moment. I didn't, right? I, had, I, I knew that crypto was an accelerating adoption curve. I knew that I could see that, you know, people were jumping in. Everyone was talking about it. My background, I was wired Ars Technica, then Bloomberg, right, and then to time. Um, I could see over the years, people were talking about crypto more and more and more and more and more. I could see this online ownership was real. I could see people were valuing how they were existing online. And we entered into the space in March 2021, and we, did, we said four announcements. I said, um, within the week, we would sell one of one NFTs, which we did on Super Rare. And that's a funny story into itself, and I'll tell you that in one second. The second is, is that we would um, accept cryptocurrencies for digital subscriptions of time. 
uh, within 30 days, um, which if you go to time.com slash hodl, which is our bad sense of humor, my bad sense of humor, my team's bad sense of humor, um, you can see the 33 different cryptocurrencies that we accept. It was 32, but we accept ApeCoin now. Um, uh, and then, uh, and by the way, we settle in Bitcoin, and we hold Bitcoin and Ethereum on our books. Um, and then I said that it would take us six or seven months to understand how we would use the token and the blockchain to figure out how we were going to build community. And for six, and we had, we had a lot of success in the first few weeks, um, and, and we were very fortunate. But for six or seven months, like, I just sat in clubhouse rooms, and I sat in what's now Spaces rooms, but there was really clubhouse rooms, and I just listened, and I would hear things, and the things I would hear were people like J.N. Silva, and I don't know if you know this artist, J.N. Silva, or Thank You X, consistently helping other artists sort of pull themselves up. I would see things like artists um, talk about how the ability to have a secondary revenue stream from royalties allowed them to pursue their passion as artists, right? As creators, something that they couldn't do before. I, I kept on seeing that um, people who were broke in 2020 were all of a sudden making meaningful lives, life sort of decisions pursuing the creatives in, in a way that they weren't empowered to before, right? So I saw a new path towards wealth. In the meantime, let's, let's contrast that to the real world too, which is, Look at the news, and you're talking about universal basic income, right? At the same time, like my team was talking to Mayor Tubbs in Stockton about putting time for kids into the classroom and doing financial literacy, and like I'm seeing two totally different things happen, right? The world sucks over here, and the world is actually being empowered over here. And I thought that was really powerful in terms of all of these contrasts that were taking place, and I started to put together that you know, as we were to build a community, the way that we had to think about the community was a values-based community. And I've talked about this quite a bit publicly, which is you know, there are two types of communities that can emerge in, in this NFT space. And they both are valuable for different reasons. One is a greed-based community, and one is a values-based community. And a values-based community stands for something bigger than just the monetary reward. Right? Values-based community stands for you know, um, the belief that you are rallying around certain principles, and that value is derived from value over time, right? Um, or value creates value over time. Um, you know, in, if you hear or listen to our owner, Mark Benioff, or like Mike Bloomberg when I was there, right? Like that's just stakeholder capitalism, right? Greed-based communities don't care about values. They just care about what's the flip, right? How do you move as fast? And I'll use whatever I can for exit liquidity and move. That's good because it keeps liquidity in the system. But if I'm going to take a brand that's 100 years old and turn it into a community movement, I have to think about values that will transcend one week, one month, one year, right? I have to think, what's, what's the values going to be for 100 years? And so, you know, like what we set out to do, and I thought this was important for me, for Maya Drazen, who's been my partner forever, for Barat Krish, who's our CTO, who's one of the best CTOs I've ever worked with in my life, for Lane Little, for um, all of our moderators that came in was, what are the values of timepieces going to be, right? And the values are inclusivity, the values are optimism, the values are constructive feedback. Don't be an asshole, right? But give me feedback if I know, if you know what to do. And, and the values are what Barat likes to call, because I think he's watching now on the live stream. Um, by the way, he has more degrees than I have family members. Um, uh, he likes to call it give first mentality. Um, and, you know, and what we do every week when we do our time halls is we reward uh, the person who embodies those values the most is the timepieces person of the week, right? And that's allowed us to build this community from nothing in 2021 in September to about 40,000 people today. It's so impressive. You have been writing the playbook for Web3, for brands. And um, I'm in talks with business leaders from Turkey, from Europe, and they all ask me the same question, like how can we become a Web3 company? And I'm saying, this is such a false dilemma. So on the other hand, we, you've shown us you can build a Web3 community while preserving your core values 
in the context of time, so you're growing times web zero, which is print business. So web two, the digital arm. Also you're creating like something like web 2.5, and also you're building the web three community. So tell us about this. Sure, so like the equation for web two, and we could talk about this in Q&A if you agree or disagree, is brand finds a creator who attracts an audience. It's that simple. Brand finds a creator, attracts an audience. Time hires Ian Bremmer, who attracts readers for whatever he wants to write about in terms of foreign policy. The equation for Web3, from what I have observed with you know, many conversations, is community, which by the way is different than audience, right? Community uplifts a creator. And then the creator, if a brand comes in, the creator's uplifted further by the brand. And because the brand validates the creator, the community validates the brand. And so what that means is essentially the equations for Web 2 and Web 3 are completely inverted. Right? What was left is right. What's right is left. And it's hard for a lot of brands because a lot of brands want to put their brand front and center. But in Web 3, it's actually the creator right now that is front and center that you have to lift up. And so for us, like as we started to build out Web3, what we realized was like our superpower was actually Web 2.5. And what I mean by Web 2.5, and this goes into the privacy question for a second that came in the previous conversation is, how can we take what we're building over here and push it in this direction towards Web 2, which is you know, all of our journalism, all of our content, all of our access to events. And how can we take all of our access to events and content and, and um, pieces and push it this way towards Web 3? So that way, people have access in ways that they wouldn't have before. And so how this comes to real life is, if you own a time piece, right? You can go to time.com and you can connect your digital wallet to time.com. We never ask who you are out of respect of privacy. We never ask who you are. And within two seconds, if not faster than two seconds, it removes the paywall and you have access in, right? So the equation for success in Web 2 is sell subscription first, right? The equation for success in Web 3 with the subscription is the subscription is utility essentially to the timepiece itself, right? It's one of many bits of utility. The equation for success in Web 2 is, is um, get people to go to your events, right? In Web 3, you know, we've had many instances where we've said to our community, we're going to hold a contest or we're going to hold a raffle and we're going to give five spots away to um, uh, you know, the time person of the year event with Elon Musk, right? Thousands of people entered in to this contest realizing that A, they'd have to dox themselves. B, they'd have to take a PCR test on the spot, right? So, but like where privacy comes into play, and I think this is really important, is in the case of the content trade-off, right, that's not good enough to ask somebody, what's your name, who are you, what's your information? In the case of, do you want to attend this event, right, the individual in the timepiece community has the choice. Do they value attending this event so much that they're willing to give their information? And if they are, that's amazing, but it's at their choice. And that's where I think the impetus or the, the, the privacy question really comes into play, which is it's not about can people see your wallet or can people see what you can do? Because everyone can see everything everywhere, whether you think it they can or can't. It's about when it comes to your individual information, Keith Grossman from New York City, here's my address, here's everything you need to know. Do I have control over that or do I not? And in Web 2, when you're a renter, you get access to all of these platforms, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and WhatsApp in return for your information. In Web 3, you control your information and you have to decide if you want to give it up or not. And in Web 2, the brand's job is, I don't care about how you value your information, right? I'm going to give you a platform to give you the ability to have your identity. In Web 3, you have to say, I have to think of you as the consumer, as the part of the community member, and I have to give you something of so much value that you're willing to identify yourself. But if not, no worries. You can be whoever you want, right? And, and we will accept you for that. Awesome. It's such a great use case for Web3. Um, 
So what are the trends that emerging trends that you are seeing in Web3 right now? And what's next for time pieces? Well, I mean, I think that this is, this is a 20-year trend, right? I think anyone who looks at this right now and thinks, thinks um, we're at the end or at the beginning um, is off. Winston Churchill has that quote, where it, it's not the, um, it's the end of the beginning. I think we're in like inning two of this. Um, I think that what we're going to see is um, uh, a lot of bumpy roads ahead for people who are overly optimistic on adoption rates. But I think that at the same time, you're going to see a lot of friction exit out of the system. And you're going to see, as friction exits out of the system, more people will enter in. But they won't talk about NFTs, but the technology will move to the back of the sort of discussion. And the experience that the consumer will have will move to the front. And like the way I would think about it is, if you think about like computers and you know, as dot-com started to take off, Everyone was talking about, at one point, the specs of their computers. I have a Pentium. I have a 486. I have 16 megs of RAM. I have a 256 megabyte hard drive. And then it was Steve Jobs who came around, and he pretty much said, like, 1,000 thousand songs in your wallet, right? And nobody talked about how much memory they had anymore, right? Like, people have such weird views of NFTs. Like, I don't get it, right? Like, it's not a political movement. It's not a psychological movement. It's a technology that allows you to validate on a blockchain ownership. Nobody should care about the technology. The technology should just empower an experience. And I think that over time, we're going to get there over probably the next two to three years, where you're really going to start to see it. And there are going to be instances where we're going to use the technology at time that the consumer's not even going to know that the technology is being used, but it's just going to provide a better experience for that individual. The example I give you is this. I remember the day that like, my mom, who is a 75-year-old Jewish woman, called me up and said, Keith, this is my mom impersonation if she's watching this, right? She's like, Keith, put me on the Twitter, right? This, this is she said, put me on the Twitter. I want to follow you. Put me on the Twitter. And um, I, know, I know if she's watching this, I'm going to never hear the end of this, right? <laughs> she, and, and I remember I was like, mom, and I was telling you the story. I was like, mom. It's Twitter. And here you go. And I got her on in like 30 seconds. There is zero shot, zero shot, like not even 1%, like zero shot that my mom is going to call me up any time in the next 12 months and say, Keith, get me a Coinbase account, um, uh, connect it to my bank account, um, transfer fiat, which she's never going to say because she would never say even the word fiat. She would think it's a car. She'd say, uh, transfer cash to Coinbase, convert to Ethereum, let it sit for seven days, get me a MetaMask account. Wait, we're not even done with this analogy yet. So it's like, I, get me a MetaMask account. What's a seed phrase? I can't tell anyone a seed phrase, right? What about the nice, nice people in, in Tajikistan who want to offer me a lot of stuff if I give them my seed phrase? Oh, now I can buy an NFT. No, that's not happening. Like, Zero shots. So when you start to look at the space, it's irrelevant how many people are in the space today. The reality is, is that there are people in the space. And every day that goes by, more people enter into the space. And anyone in this audience who has bought an NFT or anything knows that once you buy into the ecosystem and you understand the value of digital ownership, you don't go back. It's like having a black and white TV and going to a color TV. Like You don't all of a sudden wake up and say, you know what, I want the black and white TV again. You just all of a sudden start think, how could the color TV be better? Like, How can I have high definition? How can I get 4K? How can it be even more improved? And so I think what you're going to start to see over the coming year is some really important moves. I would say year to two years. Um, I think what MoonPay is doing with OpenSea is really important, right? Um, I don't think, like, we, we look close enough to say, like, wow, what does a semi-custodial wallet offer, like, mass consumership, right? Like, not having to think about that. Um, I think that the ability to buy using fiat and not having to think about the cryptocurrency itself is very important. Um, I think the fact that Visa and MasterCard have made major efforts into the space is very important. 
Um, I even think to Coinbase's credit, the fact that you could buy from the exchange and not have to transfer to a wallet is very important. All of these just represent to me like friction coming out of the system. And then as friction comes out of the system and you have more entree points in, right, more liquidity enters into the system. And so like, like I, that's how I'm looking at it. Like I look at it in terms of weather patterns, not you know, individual moments or where it's going. And, and off of that North Star that the friction will work itself out and that I genuinely believe in a shift from online rentership to online ownership to the consumer owning their own privacy, which by the way is happening legally through GDPR, CCPA and the disappearance of third party cookies. So every media company is gonna have to start to think about stuff like that. I think that all of these trends colliding paints a really transformative picture of the future of where the web can go. And by the way, when I say web three, I mean crypto, DeFi, NFTs, and the metaverse, just to, to be clear, to clarify. Awesome, so we're gonna start taking questions from the audience, but I have some yes, no questions for you. So I'm gonna just read sentences and- maybes? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are binary, like just yes or no. Okay, let's start. Digital identity is more important than physical identity. It depends on what the individual wants out of life, but I think that the digital identity, <laughs> the digital identity is, is, is very, 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 very valuable. So I take it as a yes. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what you want out of your life, right? I don't know what you want out of your life, okay, right? For but you, for you, let's do it. Um, for the purposes of, of running a media company, yes, I think that, that it is. Okay. More brands will start to offer both physical good and an associated NFT in a single purchase. Yes. As more brands will enter the Web3 world, we'll see more M&A activity as most of the brands don't have the skill set to build in Web3. Yes. I've been working even more and I've been sleeping even less since I fell into the Web3 rabbit hole. 100%. This is, I have to pause on this. Crypto is the greatest business for insomniac workaholics. Like if you're an insomniac workaholic, you should be in Web3 because it is an amazing business that never turns off. Okay, next. Even when we are at Web4, Time Magazine still will be available in print. Yes. Um, can I pause on that for a second? Let me give you the demographics just so you can have an idea for a second of um, media platforms are not universally adopted by the readerships in the same way. And people seem to always think that they are. Um, print is not dying either, right? The only thing I could point out is, is that, you know, advertising in print is definitely going down faster than consumer decline in print. Nobody could tell what consumer decline in print is. All I could say is, is it's the same thing as the adoption of Web3, which is every day that someone is born and every day that someone dies on this planet, a new print reader is not born at a one-to-one -one ratio as, as someone who dies, right? So I don't know what that ratio is, but I could tell you that it's definitely declining, right? The average reader of Time Magazine is a 50-year-old uh, white male. Um, the average reader of uh, the website is a 40-year-old female. The average reader of uh, the uh, social channels is 62% under the age of 35, one third outside the United States, 16% black, um, and the uh, 40,000 people in the timepiece community, we have no clue who they are. I could tell you from um, Discord what countries they come from, which is all over the world, right? Um, uh, and I could get a sense as to where it sort of balances out in certain things, but I don't have any clue. Now let me give you real numbers. The magazine reaches 1.6 million people. The website reaches 40 million people a month. The social channels reach 100 million people a month. And uh, Web3 reaches 40,000 people a month, right? And so you start to realize that the disproportionate perception of this brand is the magazine because it's been around for 100 years, right? And we're leaning into the magazine because the cover of the magazine is kind of the most powerful meme on the planet, right? It's, 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 a, it's a weekly generative meme for us. Um, but uh, each demographic is different based on who it is. And, and I don't see any scenario where the next 20 years the magazine is gone. Okay, last one. 
Was that, that was a good yes or no question, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, like sorry. OK. Yeah, it's fine. I'm feeling a little verbose today. I apologize. <laughs> okay. It's fine. <laughs> OK, the last yes or no question is, Time Magazine's The Person of the Year will be an NFT character in the near future. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, you know. We don't know, hear no, so. It, 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 maybe. It, you know, it's the, the person of the year is the world's funniest. Um, um, it's not an award acknowledgment for us, right? Um, uh, whether you all believe it or not, like I've, every year that I've been at Time for three years now, asked not to be involved in that discussion, period. I don't want to know anything about it. Uh, the editors do it 100%. Nobody believes me when I say that. Um, but the reason I do that is, is that if people don't like the person of the year, I could say, look, they did it. And if people like the person of the year, I could say, don't believe me, right? Um, and so, but, but um, you know, like I, I don't want to turn our NFT strategy into a gimmick. So until I see the way in which um, uh, we can incorporate person of the year into uh, our strategy in a meaningful, valuable manner, like I'm not, I'm not in a rush to do that. Awesome. Okay. We can uh, take questions from the audience. Let's uh, start. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so why do big companies that get into Web2 and NFTs, why do they charge royalties so high? Like, why? Like, it's just, like, it's so like what? So like, so here, so time pieces is 10%. But let me tell you where the 10% goes. Um, you think that that's a high royalty. 1% um, of the primary and secondary sales of timepieces goes to charity, right? And to date, you know, all the charities that we've supported have been um, free democratic presses um, and initiatives that support free democratic presses throughout the world, with the exception of one drop that we did that um, uh, raised uh, humanitarian relief for um, uh, Ukraine, for people in Ukraine. Um, we've donated since September over $560,000 to uh, charitable causes. The remaining 9% of the primary and the secondary sales is split evenly with the artists in perpetuity. So of the 89 artists that are timepiece artists, whether it's Justin Aversan or Kath Samard or Corey Van Lu or uh, Hoda Bakali or Perrin Hideri or uh, Jesus Martinez or any of these artists become part of the time family forever. And so every time a timepiece is bought or sold, um, they get a percentage of their piece on that. And so uh, when you enter into the timepiece family, part of the sort of understanding is, is that we're supporting artists and that we're building this alongside the artists. OK, we can have one more question. But Keith and I will be um, outside so we can chat. But we can have one more question. OK, what's up? We're on, we're on open C. Uh, you know, I think we have a few things on looks rare, if, you know, but, but like our primary, and we're on Coinbase NFT, but our primary, almost 99.9% .9 of time pieces is on, is on open C. So we are, we are, we are, hold on, wait, wait, wait. We're not opposed to anything, right? Like, we're not also like, I'm very much in favor of Ethereum. Uh, I don't like the L2s. Um, I, like, I just don't think that we've seen numerically any um, retain value on L2s. Uh, the reality is, is like 99% of this occurs on Ethereum today. Um, I'm not married to Ethereum, though, right? Like this space. Just send me information. My email is the easiest. And by the way, to anyone here, my email is the easiest email on the planet. When I was at Bloomberg, it was kgrossman10 at bloomberg.net. Nobody would ever remember that. So when I came to Time, my email is keith at time.com. And like anyone here can email me anything. And please send me information on it. We are always looking at different options. Um, and we will not only be on Ethereum. We will go into others. What? My Twitter is really complex. It's Keith Grossman. <laughs> awesome. Sorry. We are Sorry. You had, you had one question right there. Sorry. OK. Last question. Sorry, but we will be outside so we can chat. Please go ahead. So at the start of the talk, you mentioned how um, the idea that NFT groups are more of a shared cycle is democratic. So I have a question. Um, do you feel like this 
term psyche is almost a barrier of entry to NFTs. And if so, how can we move forward to right? So, so I, I don't think it's a, you pose the question as if a shared valued system is a bad thing. And I would say that I think it's actually a good thing. Um, I don't think it's possible to have a universal shared value system. I think that people will self-select into groups that they feel have shared values, right? And for me, like, I think that when you look at like timepieces, which is where I'll speak to, because this is the value system that we've built, the values at the aggregate level are inclusivity, it is optimism, it is constructive feedback, it is give first mentality, right? Now let me give you some real examples. Every person who's ever posted something that violates one of those, we've banned. So like while we have you know, 20,000 people in the Discord today, we've probably banned 7,000 people. Okay, you know what banning looks like? It's the most exhausting thing on the planet. Banning looks like you wake up and somebody says, I love that you chose, I love this piece, but why, but, right? Whenever there's a but, this is where you know there's a problem, right? Because they don't really love the piece. Why did you choose this artist? I'm from blank and this artist is blank. Fill that in, right? I don't want that person in the community, right? Like, I'm sorry. Like, uh, this is my community that we're gonna build and you know, like uh, the one thing that I, I think is really important is, is that we stand by a certain set of values and that not everyone's values or beliefs matter if they wanna be in our community. Now, there are other communities that can exist that, that might be more welcoming to somebody's belief system, but like I need to make sure that at the aggregate level, those values are always adhered to, right? And I think that expanding it further is impossible. Like you can't have a shared value system across the world to everyone. It's just never gonna happen. And the reality is, is that those are the values that welcome people into the community and you see it in Discord in sort of a general chat, right? You see people are very cordial and you see how people interact with each other. But then what really happens within a community is uh, when a community grows to 20,000 people, 40,000 people, you can't have um, all the people feeling the exact same way all the time in every instance. And so you have an aggregate shared value system. And then against that backdrop of an aggregate shared value system, you have a micro shared value system. And that micro shared value system falls into the different channels that people go into. So like if you go into time pieces and you go into the photography community, like they have, they all adhere to the highest level of values but then they have a different set that then sort of translates into a smaller group. And so um, I don't think, I think that it's important for the long-term sustainment of communities to be values-based because then people are looking at why they're interacting with people um, over a long period of time. Um, but I don't think every community has to have the same shared values. Like a lot of the influence to me from timepieces was what I saw in my corporate environments and also in communities like the Cool Cats or the Robotos or Dead Fellas where I thought these are really good values that I love. And, um, and so I think that there's gonna be commonalities but I don't think that it's a bad thing. I think it's, it's a good thing and that you know, people have different tastes. Awesome. Grab me yeah, outside. Let's, yeah, Grab me let's outside. bring you outside. Keith, thank you but, so much. We love how you're paving the way for brands by writing the Web3 playbook and your passion for community. Thank you so much. Thank you.